Hello everyone, my name is Pixel Riffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we are going to do a little bit more enchanting before we head out because I've just got 30 levels, meaning I can enchant another piece of equipment here. And boy, do we have a lot of options for enchanting. We've got a full set of diamond armor now and we've got a sword, an axe and a shovel including some diamonds in there that we have for another pickaxe. We could enchant basically any of that and I think we're going to go through our options first here. So we have Unbreaking 3 on a sword which is not too bad but I'm probably going to leave it for now. Fortune 2 on an axe I'm not really that interested in. We'll get the same enchantment on the shovel of course so I'm not going to get either of those because frankly I would prefer Silk Touch on either of those than Fortune, and I'll explain why when I get a chance to actually use Silk Touch. Next up, we can try out the armor, and the helmet is giving us Aqua Affinity. Really useful enchantment, allows you to mine underwater with the same speed that you mine on land, which is super cool to have. Unbreaking 3 on the chest plate could be quite useful. Unbreaking 3 on the leggings could be useful also, and Unbreaking 3 on the boots. Okay. I think out of all of those, we probably want to start with the leggings, because leggings don't have any special enchantments that can really be applied to them, aside from unbreaking and the different types of protection. So I think it's a safe bet if we enchant these with unbreaking three. There we go. We will get a protection type that we want, including protection three, which is all round protection. I'm going to re-equip the rest of the armor because we don't have a chance to enchant it until we have 30 levels again, but between... All of the different types of protection, there are more specialized types like blast protection and projectile protection, which will defend you from creeper explosions and skeleton arrows and all kinds of stuff in between. There's also fire protection, which gives us a little bit of extra protection against fire and lava, but I tend to prefer the more general type of protection because overall it will defend you against everything a little bit instead of one thing a lot. So we're ready for anything if we have the regular type of protection. I'm still getting some XP from the minerals I'm smelting up in here we have a bunch of iron and a bunch of gold still merrily cooking away in the blast furnace and the furnace but today we're going to step outside of our front door and do a bit of exploring 1.18 is all about the terrain and as of right now we've mostly been sticking around the spawn area which honestly is not the best example of what 1.18 has to offer we've got a nice big hill over here we've got a few valleys around the place but most of this is a flat and open birch forest or a regular wooded forest and there's a beach with an ocean over there we've seen a little bit further afield but i want to start exploring further we're scouting for the locations for potential projects maybe even a base of some kind and we want to see if there are any massive mountains around here that we can go looking for resources in so the first thing i'm going to do is craft a few maps because i think those will be really useful in exploring the local area. For each map, we will need a compass, which is crafted using four iron in a plus shape like that with the center replaced with some redstone dust. Compasses in Minecraft work a little bit differently to compasses in real life. In real life, the compass would point towards north and you'd be able to orient yourself pretty easily. But since in Minecraft, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west pretty reliably. Did I get those directions right? I can't quite tell. The sun is <laughs> super high above me right now. In Minecraft, the compass points points directly towards your world spawn. It always points towards the central block of the world that the entire world generates from and it's usually very close to the point at which you first loaded into the world. So we're going to walk over here, we're going to follow the point of the compass, you'll notice the needle is changing ever so slightly, it always changes to look in this direction behind us and once the needle flips around, yep there we go, we'll know that right here if we wiggle around on this grass block a little bit you'll notice that the compass is trying to point towards the central block of the world. And often this is around the 0, 0 coordinate if you press F3. In my case, I think the 0, 0 coordinate is actually out in an ocean biome. And so what the world will do is choose a world spawn point that is comfortably on land, like this one here is. The chunk all around us is land, and we can make sure that this is a safe spawn point for players. So that's a quick demonstration of what a compass does, but compasses aren't all that useful for navigation in Minecraft unless you want to find your spawn point. And in this case I've chosen to build something fairly close to my spawn point so that if we can craft the compass we can always find our way back without having to rely on the coordinates of the area. 
But when it comes to exploring further afield, the compass is used in the crafting recipe for a map. And for that, we'll need a little bit more paper. So I'm going to take down some of the sugarcane we've been farming. We will need eight paper, but of course, you need three sugarcane to make three paper. So I will need to make sure we've got enough sugarcane for that. Once we craft it into paper, we'll put the compass in the center. We'll draw paper all the way around the outside and we'll be given an empty map. As of right now, the map does not have any terrain on it. When we hold it in our right hand, it is basically just an empty item. But if we right click while holding it, it will draw a map of the immediate area. And as you can see there, I'll actually take the shield out of my offhand so we can look at this a little closer. With two hands, we can see that the house that we have built is right there in front of us. We can see the fields actually behind there with the three lines of blue with the three water streams right there. The cow pen is right there as well. We can actually see when the sheep are eating grass because a dirt block will occasionally appear in there and then be recovered by the green of the grass. Yep, there goes one in the corner. And we can see a few of the terrain features around here. We've got a nice green forest, a couple of lakes. We've got a dugout earthworks to the north of us. A few pumpkins on the hilltop just off center. It's looking like a lovely green forest. Now, when you're holding a map in your hand, up is always north. You can place these things in item frames on the wall and rotate them, so you can have them facing different directions. But when you're holding these things in your hands, up is always north, and the direction the player is facing is indicated by that white marker on the screen. You'll notice as I turn, the marker turns as well with the point always facing in the direction we are facing. So by using a map, you can orient yourself towards one of the cardinal directions without having to worry about the location of the sun. As far as maps go, this is the highest level of detail that maps can provide. This is basically as close as maps will zoom in. But what if we want to take a look a little bit further out? That is where we can start to rely on the cartography table. In order to craft a cartography table, we'll need a little bit more paper. So we're going to craft some of that out of the sugarcane I just gathered. We'll need a few logs as well. And we're going to make a crafting table shape, but with two paper over the top of it. And you'll notice that turns it into the darker wood and the distinctive pattern of a cartography table, which we're going to place in the corner right here. Opening up the cartography table interface, we can place a map inside of here, and the detail of the map will be positioned on the table so that we can take a look at it. From here, there are a couple of really neat things we can do, the first of which is expand the map by adding more paper. A single paper in this slot will change the scale of the map. If we now take this map out of the output slot, it has consumed the paper and the scale of the map has increased. So now our little house is really only just a blob in the left corner of the map. And if we step out of our front door a little way, we'll actually find that the area the map is uncovering branches out to the north and to the east. So we're in the lower left corner of this region. I'm going to disable view bobbing for this section just because it makes the map move around a lot in your hand. So now hopefully that should be a little easier to follow. And as we walk off the edge of the map, you'll notice that the map doesn't move to track the player's position. We've just walked off the edge of the area of this map and we can no longer see where we are. Once we walk back into the area that the map covers, then our player marker reappears. But if it becomes a blob on the outside of the map, then that is a pretty surefire indication that we are not on the area the map is displaying. For that, we're going to craft another map and we'll walk off the edge of this map into the area that we haven't mapped yet, open a new empty map, and that will show us the regions surrounding that. Let's make sure we're off the edge like so. We're going to open this map and now this will show us the area that includes the ocean. And as I walk further towards the border of the map where it is uncovered, it should display a little bit more of the area out that way, which is a, a pretty expansive ocean biome. Naturally, because we opened up an empty map, the scale of this map doesn't match up with the scale of this map. So once again, we're going to throw that into the cartography table and it should automatically readjust this region so it shows us a little more. And now, of course, we're in the bottom right hand corner and everything that is over the sea lies out in this direction. So despite the rain, I'm going to row out in this direction, holding the map in my hand. And you'll notice that the map only starts to update this terrain if you're holding it. So for example, if I put the map away now and hold a different object in my hand, if I row over in this direction and then come to a stop, and then I row back in the direction that I came and I open up the map again, You'll notice the map has not updated with that extra edge there that we haven't yet uncovered. But if I'm holding the map in my hand, even if I can't see it while I'm rowing in this direction, once I stop, 
the map starts to refresh and update with all of the terrain I'm now uncovering. And this region of the map naturally shows us a little further to the north as well. So we're going to make land over here on this plains biome. We're going to step out onto dry land and let's uncover a little bit more of this so we get a good view of the terrain around us. Now while I'm exploring, I like to keep the map in my offhand like this just so it's a little bit easier to read. If I have the shield out of my hands and we're holding the map with two hands, it's a little bit harder to see exactly where you are on the map or at least it's a little bit difficult to see whilst you're trying to keep your head up and aware of your surroundings and the map might also conceal something that's dangerous for us to walk into like a lava lake or a ravine or something like that so keeping the map in your main hand and your shield in your off hand is usually a good idea when you're exploring and you get a more complete picture of what terrain you are uncovering. It also means I get to see more of the landscape around me, and there are some really impressive hills over in that direction, which I think we might have to explore at some stage. Moving back in this direction over here, it's largely forests, and back over here it meets up with the ocean again. I'm going to go and do the same with this other map so that we can explore a little bit further to the north and the east. And with the maps all filled out, we're going to head to bed and get rid of this rain finally. So with both of these maps filled out and to scale, what we want to do is put them up on the walls somewhere we can take a look at them. So we're going to grab some leather that I've been harvesting from the cows every so often. We're going to break some of the logs here down into sticks and we're going to make two item frames. Item frames can be placed on any surface, the wall, the floor, even the ceiling, and we can use those to display items. We can put tools or whatever items we want to in them. But one of their best uses is for holding maps. If we right click on the item frame with a map, it will display the entirety of the map at the full size of one face of a block. So the full one meter by one meter block will be covered by the map. And if we place them side by side, we can start to build up a picture of the terrain around us, including a green marker where this map is placed. So you'll notice that is slap bang in the middle of our house right here. And so that's going to indicate where exactly this map is pinned to the wall. You can also take a copy of this map elsewhere by copying it in the cartography table or in your inventory and say for example we were to build another house up here or even just put a pillar with an item frame on it over here and attach one of these maps to it that marker would also show up on the map that isn't the only way we can put a marker on this map now because we can craft a banner and use that to place a named marker on the map crafting a banner out of six wool and one stick we're going to put this in the anvil and we're going to rename it so let's call this starter house it's not really got a name yet or anything but we can always rename name it later and that gives us a banner item that is named starter house we're going to hang this up in the house somewhere maybe up here in the bedroom where it's going to be a little bit out of the way we'll hang that in the brick fireplace chimney there now if i take this map down from the wall we're going to climb the ladder we're going to find that banner and right click on it like so and you'll see that a banner marker appears on the map which has the words starter house underneath it so the banner is now a marker on the map indicating where something is. That even shows up when we put it up here on the wall. And so using this technique, if you want to, you can mark off places on the map that are significant to you if you want to remember what they were. You can even use this to create more like a territory map if you're planning on building a massive kingdom on these islands or something like that. We'll do some more stuff with banners later on because they have a lot more that they can do than just place markers on a map. But I think this is a really interesting thing to use. One thing to note though is that banner functionality works a little bit differently on Bedrock Edition and as far as I'm aware you can't do this on Bedrock Edition yet so apologies to the Bedrock players and if you can do that now then forgive me my knowledge of Bedrock is not all that great but either way we're now looking at a decent map of our surroundings and I think maybe we want to shuffle this upwards one more block so we can place the item frame up there we could rotate the map like this if we wanted to but I think the text needs to be kind of readable and we'll move this up so that we can explore a little further to the south of us because we've explored the area north of our spawn point but the spawn point is about there and from there on downwards we haven't really done much exploration so let's craft a couple more compasses let's go grab some more paper and let's make two more maps let's wander back down to our spawn point which we can be pretty certain of being the point where the maps will switch over and let's open up one yep there we go that looks like a region that wasn't on our map and then we'll wander over in this direction 
and we'll open up map number two. Or technically, I guess these are maps number three and four, but hey, who's counting? There we go. We've got the Birch Island in the center here and the Riverlands around it. Let's go and expand these in the cartography table and we'll do a bit more exploring. In the case of the Riverlands here, it's naturally going to be a lot easier to explore these by boats. So I'm just going to row around here until the map is all filled out. And the same is probably going to be true of the southwestern map because the majority of this also is taken up by the ocean here. Back at the house, two more item frames left. Later, we can start to piece together our map of the surrounding region and it looks like we have the coastline of our continent or maybe even <laughs> kind of the lake in the center of it because this ocean biome here is actually looking like it's landlocked on most of its sides. We can see, see the landscape start to creep in around there and as we cross over this way, we run into an area that we know is a beach because that's where we've been looking for mining opportunities in that lush cave. But as we've explored around this area, we've started to uncover a few other interesting features in each direction that I think will be worth exploring in future episodes. Like a mysterious watchtower across the plains, protected by some shady looking dudes with crossbows. A shipwreck that's done a really bad parking job in the Northern Ocean. In this peaceful central forest, an ominous frame made out of blocks of obsidian. Some pretty hefty hilltops that flatten out into a meadow biome in the Northwest. And across the ocean to the west, the distant tree tops of our first jungle biome. On your travels, you might even encounter a wild growing azalea tree. And this one here in the birch forest clearly indicates that there is a lush cave generating under the surface. Now we know about this cave already because it's definitely the same cave that generated under the ravine on that beach that we've explored in previous episodes. But if we did not know that that lush cave was there, this azalea tree would be an indication that if we dug down, we would find a lush cave below this. So if you haven't found a lush cave in your world yet, seek out these trees where they grow in the wild and you will probably find a lush cave somewhere beneath them. So many of these landmarks are going to be worth exploring in future episodes, but for today I'm happy just focusing on maps for right now because there's a couple of other things we need to do with maps that we can do here in the cartography table. First of all, this is not the largest scale that maps can operate at. We can scale the map up even further if we want to. We can also copy the map by placing another empty map in here and that way we'll end up with two copies of the same map. We can put one up on the wall and we can keep the other one in our hands. And you'll notice it even copies over the banner marker that we put here to indicate where our starter house was. The map marker does not stick around if we expand the map to an even bigger scale, but just look at how big this is now. It encompasses basically the top half of our map here on the wall and another set of maps beyond that because the scale basically doubles each time. We're ending up with a one to four scale map here and we can even go as high as one to eight. This scaled up map has lost the banner marker on it so we will need to go and reattach that once we get back to the house but as you can see it takes a lot longer to explore and the scale is very different. We can't see the individual canopies of the trees anymore just a green map of leaves where this forest biome is. The right hand side of this map isn't complete until we've got all the way up here level with the mysterious watchtower over there and I think we'll probably try and fill out the rest of this map before we return to the house but it's gonna take a little while. And with this map complete the picture we get is one of a much larger world and of course the world extends near infinitely beyond this. We've got 30 million blocks of the world in every direction and overall that is an enormous amount of terrain that could not possibly fit on any kind of size of map but there are a couple of other things we can do with this map before we lay this episode to rest first of all we can reattach the starter house banner marker to it so that we can still see where that is we could put it up in an item frame on the wall if we wanted to but another thing i thought it'd be fun to do is lock this map. So if we place it in the cartography table here with a glass pane, the lock symbol appears on there and it will say that it is locked when we look at the map's item description. And what that means is no matter how many changes we make to the region around this part of the world, this map will remain the same. And so I think it could be interesting if we want to do a little bit more building around here in future to have a side-by-side -side comparison of this region of the world, have a map that is locked from more or less the start of the series 
and see how things change. This covers the north part of the world here. Of course, the Riverlands to the south is an area we could develop as well. And there are plenty of opportunities for us to see how the map changes as the series continues. But map in hand, that is where we're going to leave it for this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Pixorifs, and I hope you have a great time exploring your worlds and mapping them out. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now. Bye.